with the discovery of two more bodies tonight, the job for Suffolk police suddenly got a lot bigger. A motorist alerted police this afternoon after he saw a naked woman's body near the road. In December 2006, police in Ipswich discovered five women dead in the Suffolk countryside. The last person to see them alive was ex-cruise ship steward Steve Wright. I'm told that Steve was responsible for these bodies found locally here, and I still can't believe that he was able to, to do it or even do it. This is a huge case. When you get five murders in six weeks, oh, unprecedented. There's a sense of disbelief almost that uh, this could be happening in, in my hometown. No one had seen anything like this before. His killing spree was frenetic, at times almost unbelievable. This was the moment that Wright's fourth and fifth victims were discovered. He basically asphyxiated them, either smothered them, strangled them, squeezed the life out of them. Steve Wright became known as the Suffolk Strangler, a name his father Conrad could never relate to. He was always a woman lover, not a woman killer. You know, he had four or five different partners. I mean, the, I can understand somebody accidentally, perhaps killing one, but not, you know, one every other day. When somebody's murdered, we think about the family that was affected, you know, these innocent parties who suddenly have their lives ripped apart because a loved one has been taken from them in such a diabolical way and state. But what we often fail to see is that the person who's carried out those crimes are still loved. The impact of knowing that a member of your family is a serial killer is something that essentially breaks the foundations of everything you know, and also means that they are victims as well. Stephen Wright, he went out, he had six weeks, and he just went on a killing spree. One by one, these lovely young women were killed. He targeted them, and he took full advantage. Steve Wright was one of those human beings that blended in perfectly to society. He didn't stand out in any particular way. And that's that kind of reflection that we never really know who we're living amongst. And it's a stark warning to most of us that those people that we think are just ordinary human beings can actually be killers in disguise. He's very quiet. Very quiet. I wouldn't say boat or ghost, really. He was sitting in my house and she had no indication of me sitting next to someone who'd murdered people. As a child, Steve Wright traveled the world with his brother, two sisters, and his mother, following his father's work in the RAF. He was a bit of a tomboy, really, a tinker, you might say, you know, always full of life. When I'm done my shift, you was down the beach, because you were always in the hot country anyway, and you spent your time at the beach in the swimming pool, especially in uh, Singapore. And I can see Steve now, he's diving in and out of the water all the time, so much so his nose was becoming skinless, like he just couldn't keep out of the water. There was never any trouble. When you're a child, having continuity and kind of a sense of a solid foundation is really important. It's how you form your identity. It's how you form your sense of security. When you have quite a lot of displacement because your parents are moving around because of their jobs, unless you have a really solid relationship with those people, life can feel really uncertain and really insecure. And that can have really far reaching consequences on your personality and how you develop. You know, kids, and when there's four of them, you've got four lots of mischief, if you like, although it's never big stuff. Yeah, they're always together. It's playful, I think, is probably the better word. But there's never any trouble. I had never had to 
sort of apologise to anybody for them for anything, you know? And that was it. We know he had a, perhaps a little bit of an unhappy childhood. Um, his dad was in the RAF and uh, travelled around the world, so there was a fair amount of travelling when he was little. Perhaps never really settled in any, any one place. Every weekend, the British families always used to get together and uh, they had big parties and all you had to do, you took your bottle along to the house party and the house you went to done the food. And because we was on the, on the ring, like uh, we had all go at it. The parties, there was possibly too many, you know. In 1964, the family returned to the UK, but Conrad's relationship with his wife was in trouble. We got the train from uh, Paddington, I think. I can't remember how we got to Paddington, quite honestly. Uh, and they got the train, we were going <clears> to <throat> get off the train at Ipswich, but we were still having an argument, you know, I'm not coming with you, I want to go and see my mum, I'll take the two girls, you take the two boys. And I never thought that she would stay on that train. We got off the train in, in Ipswich, the boys got off and they was looking, you know, where's mum, you know, and where's the two girls, and of course they went. Kept on the train and went, and I never see her since. Well, he sat and watched his mother go, didn't he? Or stood and watched his mother go. He never got her back. And uh, he was only eight at the time. When you think about the stereotypical experience of a child, the idea is that they are with their mother, who nurtures and loves them. If she rejects you, the feelings that you are left with is, what was wrong with me? What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? The way that that manifests and grows can distort all the relationships that you have for the rest of your life. It's a primary rejection, it's a primary abandonment, and that's incredibly painful to deal with. I arrived home with the two boys, no wife, no girls, and my mother asked her, where are they? Well, I think they'd become sort of vacant in a way. They couldn't work it all out, you know, what is going on, you know. After a few weeks, I couldn't handle it. I went and got the girls, and uh, there was no hassle. She didn't want to keep the girls, and I ended up with the, with the four of them. With the help of my mother and father, I was able to look after them, and I was still in the RAF. Conrad soon met another woman, the kid's babysitter, who became his second wife. And as he worked, she became their main parent. And because Val come along, and uh, very difficult to uh, discipline, if I say discipline, that's a strong word, that, but to keep control, if you like, of four children that are not yours. They just trying to crowd her out. You're not our real mama, too much of that. These children were in grief. Their lives were being broken down and they needed a systematic foundation where they felt loved and cared for and compassionately received. And actually instead, they probably felt like they were a burden, a second thought. As Steve reached his teenage years, he very quickly began to forge his own life. Well, I don't suppose I see much of him, did I, <clears throat> as a teenager? Really, he worked in a uh, hotel in Alborough. He got a job on the Townsend, Torrance and Ferries. And he must have been a teenager there because he married a young girl from Wales. Considered a charming man, Steve Wright never had any problems attracting a partner, but the stability he craved eluded him. He's had two wives and I said, and he said, four or five different uh, lady friends. Well, both the girls he was married to, they stayed here for a few weeks at a time. And uh, there was no argument, you know, there's no sort of raised voices or anything like that. Everybody was happy. The fact that Wright marries tells us something very symbolic and significant. He's on a search for something. Something is elementally missing in the relationships that he experiences, so he transitions from one to another, hoping it will fix him. 
He'd come out the weekends and he got a job at the bingo hall uh, in, up in the town. But I do believe he, uh, he, he when he passes the bookies, he uh, used to take his money in there and you don't win at that game. In fact, at one time, I was, I said, well, when you get your mate wages, Steve, you bring it to me. And I like, used to put, put in a cupboard upstairs. And I said, you can have enough money to, I mean, I'm talking to someone who's 30 years plus now. You can have your spending money, but you're not going to take all of the bookies. Wright had a relatively dysfunctional upbringing and obviously had a relationship with his father that was transient at times. They were still connected and close. We know that Wright would go to see Conrad when he was struggling. He would confide in him his troubles, but obviously it never extended to confiding in him about the killings. He said he'd got a job on the QE2, but that was only for a fortnight. I'm not going, I'm not going to bother with that. I told him to go, because, uh, you know, I said, you create a good impression, you get a job. He's working as a steward, um, serving first-class first, first class customers, and went to, uh, went to some fantastic places. He admitted it in court, and he was explaining his use of, of prostitutes, and he said that started when he was on the QE2 and visiting places like Thailand. I used to pull in there for two or three days at a time, because they all went, they all went ashore. There was a programme on the television at one time, and you could see him sitting at a bar, with others, with the local female sort of all over them, you know. We know that whenever he docked, he would head straight for the brothels. That tells us quite a few things. It shows that he has low boundaries. He's quite happy to push those social norms. The first thing he's thinking of is sex, and also sex in as many different ways as he can get it with as many different people as he can have it with. But secondly, it shows low social responsibility. If you can just get off a shit and go and have sex with different people, you're not really thinking about them as human beings, you're thinking about your need first. And the problem is when you have a mindset that a sexual creature is just an object, well, you can do what you want with them, even dispose of them. For weeks now, police have been anxious to trace the two prostitutes who were friends and were last seen working in Ipswich's red light district as they wait to see whether they have a double murder on their hands. In October 2006, the body of missing sex worker Gemma Adams was found in a stream seven miles from the Ipswich home of killer Steve Wright. So at the time when these girls were being murdered, he was living with a partner and her son in this one house. He'd been here only a matter of a few months, actually. We were kind of in the heart of what was the red light area, and he used to drive around in his Mondeo and pick women up and took them back here. The first girl that went missing was Tanya Nicholl. Now, her mum reported her immediately. Then Gemma went missing, Gemma Adams went missing. You now have two women missing who are both sex workers, you know, on drugs, and they're vulnerable young women. Steve had been using prostitutes since his visits to Thailand on the QE2. Now it seemed he had a habit closer to home. The only thing I can come up with, if, if, if he was using... Uh, street workers, if you like, you know, young girls, and then he found himself physically, he couldn't sort of do what he wanted to do because of uh, medical reasons, maybe, or, you know, and uh, that threw his mind. And then maybe he kept trying with another girl and still couldn't, and he lost it. Did he ever lose his temper or, well, I mean, these were all in six weeks. I can't believe it. I still feel that something is not really finished. There's plenty of evidence that they went into the house and that he uh, later dumped the bodies, but it's only supposition, of course, that he did carry out the murders here. And the police have always said that they just don't know where he, where he did do the murders. 
the investigating team were investigating two missing persons. Although they felt they probably were linked, but they kept them separate so they could cross search. However, it didn't take too long before the investigation, the investigating officers realized these cases were linked. And then what subsequently happened, obviously Gemma was found in the stream, Tanya was found downstream. There was public appeals, they were carrying out inquiries, house to house inquiries, um, carrying out road checks of uh, cars um, in, the, in the area. It has now become a double murder. Subsequently, the other three women, their bodies were found, and that was a linked series of murders. A body of a third woman is found at, uh, in woods at a place called Nacton, again on the outskirts of Ipswich. Uh, it turned out to be Anna Lee Alderton, who'd also been working on the streets, hadn't been reported missing. It was on the same day that Paula Connell was announced missing by the early evening. There had been a report come into the police that another woman called Annette Nichols was also missing. Paula Clonell was found uh, in woods at the side of the road. Police helicopter went up and very quickly they identified another body on the ground and that sadly was the body of Annette Nichols. The two in Nacton Road were laid out um, in a crucifix position as they informed everybody else and again if if you happen to kill somebody willingly or accidentally you don't and you they think well you begin to panic and I've got to get rid of this body you then don't take it to an, uh, a wood to get rid of it and then start lying that out in a certain position that's, that's, some, that's something that I can't do have thought he would just dump the body and run, but no, he didn't. Stephen Wright chose to position two of the women's bodies in the crucifix position. One, probably, to try to throw the police off course because the other bodies hadn't been dealt with that way. Secondly, potentially for dramatic effect, because unusually, a lot of killers like to leave their work with a certain mark. And um, most importantly, because there was some thrill at the end of doing that, of creating that, of making that body look a certain way. So he was enjoying his work. At night, while his partner was working, Steve Wright was cruising the red light district, looking for sex. And this is where he found his victims. These five women, all very vulnerable. You know, they were working to earn money on the streets because they're in the grip of a class A drug addiction. There's just a feeling that, you know, this guy's got to be, got to be caught, who is clearly the same person who's doing it. Stephen Wright is out there, and under the nose of the investigating team, he's committed more murders. So was he getting a kick? Was he getting off on the fact that I'm murdering while the police are looking for me? We'll never know. But I've never known a case where you have that many murders in such a short space of time. He knew the police were out there. He'd been stopped by the police. Was he enjoying that moment, his moment, when suddenly I'm becoming, you know, quite famous in the media? Undoubtedly, Stephen Wright sees women as things that he can use for his own pleasure, his own purpose. The fact that he's using prostitutes pretty much on his doorstep means that he has absolutely no respect for his relationship, but also sees women as something that he can use to his own benefit and purpose. He is pushing his boundaries consistently. And the problem with boundaries is if we have a predisposition for doing great harm, there is a point that that boundary snaps. And that's what happens. Steve Boundary gets to a point where the boundary snaps. I never heard on the television, I suppose. When I heard, when this happened, I never thought anything about Steve. Well, I was just reading about it and... Uh, just didn't, you know, that much interest in a way, I suppose. 
The sad thing about these cases, these five women, although they are sex workers, you know, this is there's someone's daughter, there's someone's sister, there's someone's child, and they were vulnerable, they're at risk. These young women were on those streets, they were addicts, they needed support and they needed help. And sadly, they were vulnerable to the likes of Stephen Wright. He knew they were vulnerable and he took advantage. And we'll never know, unless he tells us, what actually he did and how he lured them and what he did and how he got them on his own. Well, anybody that does something like this, and five bodies in six weeks have got to snap in their head. You know, no control whatsoever. It's not, a, you can't be a normal person. Something went wrong. But I can't see why you've done it. What have you got against them? Detectives have spent the day trying to cast more light into the shadowy world of Ipswich's red light district to try to answer the question, who murdered five prostitutes? In the lush countryside outside Ipswich, Steve Wright was taking advantage of his local knowledge and had disposed of the bodies of women he'd murdered in areas he thought they'd never be found. I'm told that Steve was responsible for these bodies found locally here, and I still can't believe that he was able to, to do it or even do it. But it seems as though he was found guilty and that's the end of it. The murders weren't Steve's first experiences of sexual violence. A former wife of his gave an interview talking about him being thoroughly abusive right from the point where their relationship started. Uh, so there, there is that side of him, without a doubt. Wright was not a nice man to be in a relationship with. He was a domestic abuser, he was violent, he was controlling. And this tells us something really important, because if you are able to harm the people in your life that you are meant to protect, what does that suggest about you with a stranger? We know three of Stephen Wright's victims were asphyxiated, so he had his hand around their throat, or was he trying to smother them or block their windpipe? Did the girls die during, you know, the act of sexual intercourse with Stephen Wright? Or did they die, you know, because he was strangling them at the same time? Or did they, were they strangled after? We'll never absolutely know what happened, because unless Stephen Wright ever tells us. Um, but the facts are quite simple. We know that he strangled three girls. He was called the Suffolk Strangler. Um, I suppose it's a headline writer's coined that sort of name, and I think it, uh, it stuck. This violent side of Steve was not something that his father saw. He said two wives, and I said, and he said four or five different uh, lady friends, if you like, and not one of them said anything detrimental about him. You know, no one complained. If he was violent or argumentative or whatever, surely one of them would would say to me, you know, can you have a word with Steve or whatever? No, no. It's not just one person, there's five or six of them. The fact that Comrade struggles with believing that his son was capable of murder isn't unusual. It's a sense of cognitive dissonance. You can't have two conflicting beliefs at the same time. You can't say to yourself, my son is a hateful, psychopathic, torturous murderer, and I love my son, he's a great guy. It just doesn't work. He was all right at the weekends and coming out with me, cricket, we used to do cricket and we have a uh, cricket tea and we have a drink after the match. I'm led to believe there's two so easily that's double life, but I can't believe it because I, I was with him so many times. After his marriages ended, Steve drifted in and out of relationships and work often ending up back at his dad's home whenever he was in trouble. Well, this is where Steve used to 
um, bed down when he was here. And uh, he'd got, sometimes kind of work, I've come to bed very early. And uh, this is where he kept. Done what he wanted to do and no one sort of was checking on him to see what he was at. In fact, we thought he was, you know, he'd got a home here whenever he wanted it. I think it's interesting that Stephen Wright went on from being a quiet introvert, you know, apparently quiet individual who didn't bother with many people. However, there was two sides to this guy. I'm sure his dad didn't know that he was, you know, frequently using sex workers. And I'm sure when his wife was at work all night, she didn't know while she's at work he's having sex with young women. Although, he, you know, he's a loner and he was quiet, he clearly was someone who had a very, very dual personality, very strange. I know he did try to commit suicide once. I got a call three or four o'clock in the morning when I was on night to say that my son had been found in a car, <clears throat> his girlfriend's car, with a hose, and he was taken to Peterborough Hospital, where I went. And I can remember saying something like, what did you do that for, boy? And I don't know whether I got an answer from him, I can't remember. Stephen Wright has a level of self-loathing. There is absolutely some kind of conscience there. He's a man who has felt so unhappy that he's wanted to kill himself. When things go wrong for Stephen Wright, there is some kind of extreme reaction, whether that's trying to commit suicide, whether that's going out and gambling lots of money, whether it's having sex with prostitutes, we know that he can't cope in a cogent way. He finds usually a negative behavior pattern to deal with his self-pain and self-hate. Another dramatic event occurred when Steve's mother reappeared in Ipswich, the first time he'd seen her since he was eight. Well, his sister getting married 30 years later his, his mother then come from America, they arranged it somehow, and she wanted to visit the children. And she went to see Steve at a, a pub in Plumstead, I believe it was, and uh, he didn't like it. He says, why now, after 30 years? And I think <clears throat> if his head or mind did change, I think the shock of that was probably what set him off. The fact that Conrad thinks that Patricia walking into the pub that Stephen Wright worked at and connecting with him again could have made him so angry that he chose to go out on murder just does not make sense. Stephen Wright had an opportunity to reclaim his relationship with what was his initial primary caregiver and he chose not to. So there was something in his psyche saying that he had made a choice that she was not required in his life. And that could suggest that he has resentment and bitterness and hostility that he knows would play into that relationship with his mother if he sustained it. So it was better to reject. In Ipswich, concerned the man and now dubbed the Suffolk Strangler would strike again, police quickly made an arrest for the murders of the women. But it was not Steve Wright. The police would have been looking at a number of lines of inquiries around people who went with sex workers. They'd arrested a guy on suspicion of all five murders. He was a guy who um, frequented the, the, the red light area, befriended uh, a lot of the women who were working there. A lot of them had been to his house. However, the police had managed to recover DNA from three of the victims. From the 1st of November, when Tanya was reported missing, to the 15th of December, when the five murders got linked, the police then managed to fast-track DNA, the forensic evidence. Steve Wright's DNA was already in the police DNA database at this point. He had been working in a hotel in Felixstowe some years previously, and had, I think, stolen some money from the till. It was a matter of 80 pounds or so. But he was caught and he was arrested, and as a result, his DNA was taken. Um, that meant it was on the police records. So when they recovered DNA from the three victims found on dry land, they were able to compare it to the national database. And hey presto, it was Steve Wright. Police arrived before dawn to make a second arrest in two days. 
Stephen Wright was taken from his home. Shortly afterwards, both the house and road were sealed off. Well, I got uh, a knock on the door, a male and a female, from one of the reporters in the national paper, and they told me your son has been arrested for the Nipsey's murders. I couldn't believe it. On the 19th of December 2006, Stephen Wright was arrested in his home and charged with the murders of five women. I just can't find you on the phone, mate, at all. How is Kate worth doing that? But the thing is, there's not been any more, has there? Once he's locked up, there ain't no more. Steve's DNA had matched that found at the crime scenes. As soon as they got that fast-track DNA through, they knew it was him, they pieced it all together, and they charged him on the 21st of December. And I think everyone in Suffolk and across the country felt, what a relief. And for those people in Suffolk, thank goodness someone was locked up for it. Because people were frightened to go out. It was leading up to Christmas, you know, festivities, parties. And everyone was worried. You don't want to be out on the street. You know, it's really, really worrying. So, great piece of police work. Neighbours were very surprised. People didn't know him that well. He'd only been here a few months. Um, I think one chap was... He used to told me that he spent a lot of the time cleaning his car, and that was about it. But the police were convinced Steve was their killer and visited the home that, over the years, Conrad had shared with his son. Yeah, they, what, they turned up, they said, uh, can we have a look in your garage? I said, well, you can, but there's nothing in it, it's empty. And when I come out, the son and the mirror were struggling to get to me first because they thought I had things to say. Well, I hadn't got nothing in there. And uh, they were pushing and shoving, and, and I piled into them in the end. On the 22nd of December, Stephen Wright attended Ipswich Magistrates Court. Steve Wright was uh, very quickly charged with five counts of murder, a Crown Prosecution Service, talked to the police, and had very quickly decided that there was enough evidence to, to charge him. It was a packed courtroom. I think uh, they had to arrange 70 seats for, for journalists. And Steve Wright came in, and I was around with a, almost had a sort of quizzical kind of look on his face. At this stage, nobody knew the extent of the evidence that there was against Steve Wright. You know, there's no end of forensic evidence. There was DNA, there was fibres of his clothing found on bodies. Um, fibres from his house found on bodies. DNA from the girl's blood of some of the victims found on his clothing. None of that. Nobody, nobody knew any of this at, at that stage. He finally faced trial on the 16th of January 2008 at Ipswich Crown Court. Well, I went to court every day and uh, we got there. We were first to arrive, actually. My son took me and then I saw the families, ar <coughs> families arrive and I said, well, I can't sit with them. You know, and because initially when it all started, they were crying and all sorts. And I sat in what, another room, and uh, the press were in there as well. Sat as close to the front as I could. The trial was long awaited. It was uh, some 14 months or so after the murders, and a huge amount of interest. Naturally, all the families of the victims wanted to see justice done for, the, for their loved ones. Um, so it's a big moment for, for them as well. And this was the first time that they got to see Steve Wright in the, in the flesh and hear the evidence against him. I did see him once when I went, when he got up uh, before the actual case, he was brought into the court. And I stood up and, and he came, he was in a glassed off area. And I think now that he looked and he saw me, but that was all, you know? And he just went. And I thought when I come out, at least he knows I was there. Well, I felt the evidence was pretty overwhelming. Um, 
there was his DNA was on the bodies of the free women who were found on dry land and there was forensic evidence in the form of clothing fibers from his clothes and those same fibers were also found on the bodies of the, the, the women. I remember uh, Tanya Nicole. Her body had been in water for some six weeks or so, but the police still recovered uh, a quite a large, about a five millimeter long fiber from caught up in her hair. There was about a, over 170 individual pieces of uh, forensic evidence. The police got him on his DNA and when he was being questioned in court, every answer was no comment, no comment. The jury convicted him in about six hours. I mean, this is five murders, but that just shows you the evidence was overwhelming, compelling evidence. DNA was a golden nugget, but combined with all the other forensic evidence, particularly on Tanya Nicholl, that fibre in her hair that had come from the foot well of his car, it was done. I think the families were, there were sort of some gasps of relief that justice was being done. But no reaction from Steve Wright and the dog. I looked at him, he looked down. Still that same pretty blank expression. The jury come in and find him guilty. And that's the end of it. There's no follow up, you know, not to my mind anyway. Not long after the court case, Conrad went to visit Steve in jail. At Belmarsh, I had to book in because I had an appointment and I had to empty all my pockets. And uh, so I'd got nothing when I went into the sort of waiting room to be called. And uh, I sat in the waiting room <clears throat> and there was other people there, women with kids. But I looked around and I think I was, felt I was the only one with a suit on, you know? And uh, then I got called in to uh, do my searching, like, and I had to take my jacket off and lift your arms up. And then you stand in a square, little square, and they, they bring the dogs in and sniff all around you. Thinking I'm taking drugs in, I suppose. You know, but I went through that. And I was thinking at the time that I ain't coming here anymore. But then it was all for nothing anyway, because uh, according to one of the officers, they wouldn't see me. He said, your son won't see you. There's nothing we can do about it. The fact that Wright won't see his father in prison is absolutely telling. He knows that he committed those murders. And he knows that Comrade, as much as he tries to think about his innocence, understands really somewhere that that's the case confronting who he really is with someone who really never knew him but that he loved is something that emotionally he just can't deal with. It's as simple as that. It's cowardice. Steve did make one attempt to get in touch with his dad. I got a letter from him once to say <clears throat> that he believed I was the only one that believed he was innocent and stuff like that. Now, why would he say th things like that to me? Well, I got rid of him at this moment in time, today. I wish I'd have kept it, but I had to get rid of it then because it was sort of upsetting me in a way. I used to keep getting out and looking, getting nowhere, and I thought, well, everything, all these photographs went, <clears throat> got clearer. He wasn't crying out for help. And he seemed to be quite happy taking the, the punishment that had been dished out to him. He knows where I am, because I'm in the same house. And you would think, you know, decently, he would uh, write to his dad and say, well, look, Dad, I've done this and I've done that, and I'm sorry, and things like that, but not even that. Nothing. I think I've really got accustomed to it. I think that Stephen Wright is one of the most dangerous types of human being. And I think that having a relationship with him would be challenging for anyone. But I also think there is some synergy between Comrade and him that is unresolved and needs to be resolved. And maybe building a relationship of some sorts would help them both. 
I don't know why I'm worrying and thinking about Steve, quite honestly. We should be thinking about the girls involved and their families. Conrad's biggest struggle is that somewhere in him, he still loves his son. He still cares for him. And to some degree, it's important that at some point he realises that that's OK. It's OK for us to love the part of the human being that we knew. We can reject the part of that human being that did harm, but there is nothing wrong with still loving somebody who did horrible things. And making peace with that is really important because it's not your guilt to carry. It's theirs. I think it's a must be a very difficult thing for any parent to think or to realise my son is a, a serial killer and is responsible for the deaths of five innocent women. The evidence is there that he did, he did kill those women, murdered them. I don't think we'll ever know unless Stephen Wright one day decides that he wants to talk or maybe a member of the family will get him to talk or maybe his dad will go and visit him. I've got to say, if it was my child, I think I'd want to go and find out and say, why did you do it? What caused you to do it? Maybe I should uh, write a letter and see whether the prison governor would pass it on to him. That might be a challenge for me to see whether, in fact, I got an answer. If I can find out that prison, that's what I'll do. I'll write a letter to him and see whether I get an answer. I don't think I particularly want to go to see him if he's in there permanently, because that'll upset me and that'll certainly upset him. But I would still like to know the missing bits of the puzzle. As far as I'm concerned, there are missing pieces. Mm -hmm.